would be booked to supply me with flat plywood. You know what I'm saying? It's completely warped. Oh, hey there, and thanks for coming to our local woodworking meetup. If you don't know, we're a group of hobbyists and friends from the area who like to meet up once every two months and discuss some of our projects, share tips and tricks, you know the deal. I know it's a bit unfortunate that we have to meet up in an Applebee's parking lot, but before you ask any questions, yes, we do have a permit. Wendell, show him the permit. So yeah, we do have permission to meet here. So I'll go first with my project for this month. So you guys may have realized, I built another mechanical keyboard. I just can't get enough of those things, but honestly, this is probably the last one I'm gonna build for a hot minute. I wanted to build a really cool matching numpad and 60% keyboard set, because the way I use the computer and the way I work, I always gotta have a numpad in the mix. I love numpads. And I always think it's really cool when you have a keyboard and a matching numpad that are the same aesthetic. And I love high quality keyboards for the same reason that I love nice furniture. Even though they seem like very different things, I like things that work nicely. I like nice things, not necessarily expensive things. Like, you don't catch me out here flashing a Rolex watch to impress people, or driving around in a Tesla or a Bentley to show people how allegedly successful I am. When I say I want nice things, I want a keyboard that sounds super nice and is incredibly ergonomic. I want a dresser. Oh my gosh, I'm praying for a dresser where all the drawers come out smoothly. It has enough room to house all my clothing. There's no jamming. It doesn't wobble back in between a shape of a rectangle and a rhombus because it's made of particle board and held together with non-glued dowels. And mechanical keyboards offer the perfect ergonomic experience because you get to choose the switches, you get to choose how soft or how tactile the press is. You get to choose really cool keycaps with all different type of profiles and you get to choose a case so it's just this awesome, really fun, aesthetic and functional thing to build. So I'll go through the actual keyboard really quick. I got the KBD Fans DC60 Rev3 PCB and the KBD Pad MK2 PCB for the numpad. For the switches, I'm a linear girl. I love those quiet soft press switches. I chose Gateron Milky Yellows. Made sure everything worked well and that was the extent of the keyboard build. First part of the build. Potato numpad. Potato numpad, potato numpad, potato numpad for me and for you. So for the numpad, I got a chunk of walnut and a piece of paper and I just started doodling. I wanted a unique shape that maybe you didn't see all around, so I settled on this weird organic potato shape for better or for worse. So I doodled that on a piece of paper and I cut it out in quarter inch MDF to make my template. And in my last video about restoring that chair, I explained all about template routing and why I use template routing instead of just my bandsaw to get my desired shape. Now that my potato shape was created, it was time to cut out the center rectangle for the numpad to stick through. And note, I should have done this before I cut the potato shape, because to cut out that perfect rectangle in the center, I needed some type of flat reference surface for my fence to write along. But at this point, there were no parallel lines because my numpad had become this organic blob. Luckily, I was able to get around it. I made this like sacrificial fence to cup around it and then create the straight edges for me to write along. But you know, if you did do this, I would switch the steps. And now it's time for the rabbits on the underside. There's two rabbits, one to fit PCB and one to fit the acrylic backing plate. A rabbiting bit is a type of router bit with a bearing at the bottom and an extending straight bit. And this is used to cut little ledges, little recesses into wood. So your bearing will ride along the reference surface and cut that equal a quarter inch distance inward all the way around. I used my bandsaw to cut out the acrylic backing. And then tore off the protective covering. And this numpad has LEDs at the bottom, so that is why I wanted to do an acrylic bottom so they could shine through. And just a note, I do a lot with keyboards, so I always keep a set 
of M2 standoffs and tiny screws on hand. M2 is a metric size classification denoting two millimeters in the outer diameter of the screw. I drilled corresponding holes with the numpad mounting plate into the lower rabbet to house these M2 threaded standoffs and I super glued them into place. And I did the same for the upper rabbet to mount the acrylic plate. I used my plunge router with a half inch spiral up clip it to cut the USB channel. I actually did this freehand. Woohoo! And a little bit of a chisel to clean it up. And finally, I glued in these maple buttons as feet, and this would allow the numpad to be slightly elevated off the desk and let the backlight shine through. After sanding, I applied a few coats of shellac, and then I used steel wool in between each coat to buff out any of the finish to make it real nice and smooth. And that's all for this little potato numpad. It was pretty straightforward. Now it's time for the 60% keyboard. This was not straightforward. This keyboard went through three iterations, the third one, which was a successful design. About a year ago, I actually tried to make a solid walnut case for this board, but other stuff showed up and it fell to the wayside and I just stopped working on it. And I'm really glad that that case sat in my shop for a year because it shows probably why you shouldn't make a 60% keyboard case out of solid walnut. This piece of walnut wasn't sawn in any particular way, not particularly stable, and you can see after a year of sitting in my shop how warped it is. Can you imagine this sitting on your desk and you're trying to type on this? And just a disclaimer, a lot of people make keyboard cases out of solid wood, and a lot of professional companies actually make keyboard cases out of solid wood, but this particular piece of walnut warped over the course of a year. And I actually made a solid oak keyboard case a year ago, and I even made a whole video about it. That one is still, it's still holding up great, it's super flat, it functions just as it should, but it's just this particular piece of walnut warped, and I think in the future I would never want to risk that. So that's why I'm all for making keyboard cases out of these solid substrates like plywood or MDF. And quick note, I'm not concerned about using solid walnut for the numpad just because of how small it is. So at this point, I knew I needed to use a stable substrate like MDF or plywood, which do not move with seasonal humidity changes. I had a lot of MDF, so I started with MDF as the substrate. Cut the MDF to the approximate size. I used my half inch spiral up clip to core out all of that center material for the keyboard to sit inside of. I super glued in the threaded M2 standoffs, and this is what will secure the keyboard into the case. And at this point, I glued some solid walnut end caps to the board. This way, when the veneer went on, the MDF sides wouldn't be exposed. And now time for the veneer. The product I'm using is real wood veneer with an adhesive backing. Now let's talk about veneer for a second. So you have real wood veneer and plastic veneer. These are two very different things. Every single piece of furniture you find at Walmart or Ikea is gonna have this plastic fake wood veneer printed on. This is a sheet of plastic with a wood pattern printed onto it and then it's adhered to a substrate like particle board. Now this is completely in contrast to real wood veneer which is nothing to sneeze at in terms of quality. High level woodwork actually create their own veneer by handpicking selections of lumber, cutting them into these thin rectangles, and stitching them together with glue and tape. By creating your own veneer, you can craft your own unique patterns by matching up the grain however you please. And since real wood veneer is real wood, it's just super thin, it will still accept finish and stain. So like your eight quarter chunk of walnut is like the Christmas ham roast, and then your shop sewn veneer is like local deli meat. They're still both ham. I don't create my own veneer because I don't have the bandsaw for it, and I kind of just don't want to. So I get this product that's, it's real wood veneer, it's like a 32nd of an inch thick, and it has the adhesive backing, which makes it so easy to apply. And so if you're someone like me, you want real wood veneer, but you're not like, going that hardcore into it, it's a great product, I recommend it. So here I cut the veneer to the approximate size and then I peeled off the adhesive backing at the back and started sticking it onto the MDF substrate. Then I cut out the hole in the center for the recess. And this is where things started to get a little crusty. Since this veneer is real wood, it still has grain direction. And you'll see on the sides here, 
I'm cutting and scoring across the grain and trying to fold it down into that recess and it was just not sticking to the side. And also, I cut the USB slot before I put on the veneer. So here I am trying to cut out the veneer for the USB slot and oh my god. It looks so bad. I was I was starting to go into hardcore denial. And here I am trying to sand and break the edges so they blend in a little bit with the end caps. But if you look really close, you can see that 30 seconds of an inch veneer on top and it's just crusty looking. I really went through the seven stages of grief with this board. Shock, the initial shock of having your project go wrong. I planned it out so many times in my head. How could it look so bad after all this planning? Denial, starting to lie to yourself. It really doesn't look that bad. I mean, who's even gonna look at the backside of it anyways? And if you stand like five feet away and squint, you can't even really see all the issues with it. Anger, starting to break down in frustration. I'm just so angry that I feel like I can never get anything right in my shop. I spent so much work into this keyboard and now it's not even going the way I want it to and it looks like absolute trash. Bargaining, you know, I can fix it. So much of woodworking is just fixing your mistakes. I bet if I add some wood filler, you won't even be able to tell how weird the veneer looks. Depression. I literally can't do anything right. I'm a fraud woodworker, and I'll never make anything beautiful in my life. Acceptance and hope. Everybody makes mistakes. I'm gonna make a lot of mistakes since I'm learning, and this is my first time trying to do something like this. So you know what? I think I've realized. I gotta redo this board. So now we're on to iteration three, which is the plywood base, and it was the successful version. And I'm gonna go on a quick discussion about plywood versus MDF. Both have their uses, but plywood is unequivocally stronger. So check this out. I have a really thin strip of plywood and a really thin strip of MDF. Plywood reminds me of those wafer cookies and MDF is more of like a brownie rectangle. The first one has layers and the second one is a completely homogenous mixture. So it's important to remember that if MDF gets really thin, it's gonna break pretty easily. Whereas plywood has the benefit of all those overarching layers, you know, laminating against each other, protecting it a bit better. So for the construction of this, I started with a plywood base and then I used floating mortise and tenons, which are basically like just long strips of MDF. So I cut those recesses in. set in the MDF strip, and then glued on these front and back pieces. After all the glue was dried, I took it to the table saw to clean up all the excess overhang, and then finally flush trimmed it to get it perfectly flush all the way around. I added roundovers to all the edges so that the veneer will glide over that continuous surface. And I was running out of veneer at this point, so that explains why there's like weird cross grain section at the bottom. And then here's the part where I cut two chunky walnut rectangles to act as the side caps. I use the same floating tenon technique that I did for the base. And note, I'm doing this on a pretty thin section of plywood, but it worked really well because of how strong the plywood is. But I can guarantee you, if I did this exact same thing, same dimensions with MDF, and tried to cut that quarter inch mortise into the MDF, it would probably crackle and crumble and really not be a good time.
The USB slot on my first attempt was so horrible because I cut the slot first and then veneered on top of it. On my second try, I veneered first, then cut the slot. The purpose of the blue painter's tape is to reduce any tear out, and it worked out so beautifully if I do say so myself. <gasps> Yay! I cut a half inch hole into the bottom of the board, again using blue painter's tape to reduce any tear out, so you can easily access the reset button on the printed circuit board. I also added a series of holes on the bottom so that the LED backlights could shine through. And for the finish, I use shellac, same as the numpad, and using steel wool to buff out the finish in between coats. I did about six coats, I think. A keyboard that you use every day is particularly hands-on, so I wanted to make sure that the finish was pretty durable. And I super glued on these little rubber feet that I stole from an old plastic keyboard I had, and that's the finished keyboard for this one. I screwed it into place using the standoffs and I put on these XDA Profile white keycaps which I think fit the vibe perfectly. And my friends, that's all I have to say about making your own keyboard. And so if you guys want to put on your headphones, I'm going to queue up the sound test and we can see what this thing sounds like at the end of the day, okay?